From modeling for Ebony and Jet magazines, to Broadway, and even to film, this woman has done and accomplished quite a number of things and pioneering the way for women behind her during a time when women, or more specifically black women, were not really given much to choose from in terms of a life's path. Today, we'll be diving into the life and times of Miss Diane Carroll. But before we get into it, hi, my name is Shada, and I like to make videos about people and events that I find interesting from both the past and present. So if that's something that interests you, definitely consider hitting the subscribe button. And without further ado, let's get into it. Carol Diane Johnson, who would later go by her stage name, Diane Carroll, was born in the Bronx, New York City on July 17, 1935, to parents John Johnson, a subway conductor, and Mabel Folk, a nurse. While she was still an infant, the family moved to Harlem, where she grew up, at least for the most part, as there was a brief period where her parents had left her with her aunt and uncle in North Carolina, which is where her mother was originally from. In her autobiography that was released called Diane in 1986, she opens up about how this resulted in her having issues with feelings of abandonment in the years to come. Carol's parents were not doing so well financially for a time and so decided to hand her over to a family that could take care of her for a short period while they got their ducks in a row as one might say. She would simply wake up, look around for her mom and dad, and soon made the realization that they had left her behind. This would leave a lasting impact on Carol that she wouldn't quite begin to repair until years later. Carol would eventually go back to living with her parents in New York City and attend the Music and Art High School, now known as LaGuardia Arts. She was also a classmate of the actor Billy Dee Williams. In many interviews in her later years, she recalls the support of her parents and their enrolling her in dance, singing, and modeling classes, and they really did their best to push her to pursue her artistic endeavors. As a child, she loved singing Singing, and years later she began taking lessons in downtown Manhattan after being offered a scholarship by the Metropolitan Opera. She was able to study both German and Italian theater and music from her instructors along with piano and finishing classes in which students are taught the finer aspects of etiquette and soft skills. So pretty much how to exude an elegant ladylike demeanor and posture. Carol's parents had managed to get their finances in order and had the means to make sure she was always dressed well and take her out to various Broadway shows. She began modeling for Ebony Magazine when she was 15 years old, which her father did not approve of as he did not view modeling as a good occupation for a lady or more specifically, a good Southern Baptist lady in his words. On one of her first shoots, she modeled lingerie and her father would see the photos and was furious. She did go on to also say that her father was just all around a very strict parent. In her family home, the going consensus was that you didn't pluck your eyebrows and wearing lipstick was kind of a no-no. However, I think when she looked back on it as an adult, she realized that this was simply how most parents at the time treated their children and there was just a want to protect them from the elements of the outside world, so to speak. Due to her demeanor and the way in which she carried herself, she became somewhat of a target for bullies. Carol never got caught up in the wrong crowd, stayed away from alcohol and smoking, and had a preppy way of dressing. Just always neat and well put together. Naturally, this drew attention and there was some jealousy developing in those around her. Quite often, some of the girls from her school would follow her to find an opportunity to jump her and unfortunately, one day, they were successful. They ripped out pieces of her hair and really went out of their way to humiliate her. And because of this, she would eventually end up switching schools. Carol would soon start entering television contests, and one day she was approached by a friend of hers by the name of Alyssa Oppenheimer, who wanted them both to go on to the Arthur Godfrey show. As they started rehearsing and making plans, they decided to come up with stage names, as Oppenheimer and Johnson, in her words, were not too pretty. Later that night, her friend Alyssa would call her, stating that she had now changed her name to Lisa Collins, and then says to Carol that she would like her to now be Diane Carroll. And without really thinking about it, she decided to go along with it. And that's pretty much how we got to Diane Carroll. So I'll be referring to her as Diane from here on out in the video. Diane had stayed persistent in her pursuit of being in entertainment, 
but she did end up attending New York University for a time after graduating from high school where she would major in sociology. However, she left before graduating to continue on in show business, promising her family that if the career did not materialize or bring about anything significant after two years, she would then return to college. Her big break came at the age of 18 when she would appear as a contestant on the Dumont Television Network program called Chance of a Lifetime, which was hosted by Dennis James. The show aired January 8, 1954, where she took the $1,000 top prize for a rendition of the Jerome Kern Oscar Hammerstein song, Why Was I Born? She also went on to win the following four weeks. Diane also performed at nightclubs like Manhattan's Cafe Society and Latin Quarter. She also made her film debut that same year in a supporting role on the film Carmen Jones as a friend to the main character played by Dorothy Dandridge. In the beginning, she says she really did not want to audition for the part, mainly because of her parents' influence over her at the time. The role she would be auditioning for would be that of a tart, as she explains it, which was what they called a sexually loose or immoral woman back in the day. Regardless, her agent had pushed her to do it anyway, and she secured the role. She went on to say that she was happy to be there because of the atmosphere and the experience that she was receiving while working there. Diane also referred to Dorothy as one of the most beautiful things she'd ever seen in her life, and she was very sweet. She had also formed a pretty close friendship with Otto Preminger, who was the director of the film. She had become pretty fascinated with what he did and knowing why he did it. Every day of filming on set, he would call her and refer to her as String Bean, more than likely because she was pretty small at the time, and he was overall very fascinated with her curiosity of the filming process. Around this time, she'd also star in a Broadway musical called House of Flowers, and two years later, she played the role of Clara in the film version of George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess in 1959. But her character's singing parts were dubbed by opera singer Luli Jean Norman which is something that ended up happening to Dorothy Dandridge and Carmen Jones as well when her voice was dubbed over for a more operatic sound. The following year, she made a guest appearance in the series Peter Gunn in the episode entitled Sing a Song of Murder in 1960. In 1956, she was married to her first husband, record producer Monty Kay, which was presided over by Adam Clayton Powell Jr. at the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, but not without protest from her father as he did not think he was a good fit for her on account of him being a darker-skinned Jewish man, and he also did not attend the ceremony. But I'm sure he wasn't the only one with similar views considering the time period. They were married for a few years and Diane gave birth to a daughter by the name of Suzanne Kay in 1960. The marriage would end in 1962, which could have been the result of her having a nine-year affair with the actor Sidney Poitier starting back in 1959 while they were both very much so married. In 1961, she also starred alongside Sidney and also Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward in the film Paris Blues. She describes this as being an interesting time in her life as she was trying to figure out balancing being a mom while also struggling with ending her marriage. And according to her, so were all of her other cast members in terms of the last part anyway. So they all had become friends, bonding over impending divorce, I guess? But it still came with a little discomfort, particularly on Diane's part, considering her affair with Sydney. She would also go on to win the 1962 Tony Award for Best Actress in a Musical, the first time for a black woman, for portraying Barbara Woodruff in the Samuel A. Taylor and Richard Rogers musical, No Strings. Diane had decided to move forward with the divorce filing from her husband, Monty, after Sidney had persuaded her that he would also file for a divorce from his wife so that they could be together. Initially, Sidney did not keep up his end of the bargain, but Diane still went through with hers. She attempted to move on, but Sidney Sidney would divorce his wife a few years later in 1965. They did try to have a relationship, but according to Sidney, they would end things because he wanted to live with Diane for six months without her daughter being present so he would not be jumping from one marriage straight into another, as he put it. She refused to do that, of course, because that would probably mean that she would see her child a lot less. However, I find that very interesting that he thought he could come in and make demands like that when you already knew she was a mother. That's pretty wild. From 1968 to 71, Diane had played the main character in the TV series Julia, who was a black nurse and a widower to a husband that died in the Vietnam War, trying to raise a young son on her own. This had also made history as being the first show on television where a black actress did not play the part of a domestic worker. 
The series was nominated for five Primetime Emmy Awards, including one specifically for Diane, and she also won the Golden Globe Awards for the Best TV Star in 1969. In 1974, she would be nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actress for her starring role alongside James Earl Jones in the film Claudine. The part had been written specifically for the actress Diana Sands, who had made guest appearances on Julia as Diane's character's cousin, Sarah. But shortly before filming was to begin, Diana learned she was terminally ill with cancer and she attempted to carry on with the role, but as filming began, she became too ill to continue and recommended her friend Diane take over the role. Diana would unfortunately pass away in September 1973 before the film's release in April 1974. Leading up to the point, Diane had been given a number of roles that one might say were a little more on the bougie side, so there were a number of doubters when it came to her capability of playing another type of character. She did end up proving them wrong, however, when she brought the character of Claudine to life who was a single mother living on welfare with six children. Even when discussing the role, she gets very passionate about how people have such misconceptions about how people look and how stereotypes play into it as well when it comes to how society passes judgment. Around this time, Diane was engaged to the British television host and producer David Frost from 1970 until 1973. She referred to him as very intelligent, but according to Diane, they ended their relationship because he wanted children, but she didn't want any more. Which is pretty unfortunate because she says that they really did enjoy their time together. In February 1973, she surprised the press by marrying Las Vegas boutique owner Fred Glusman. After four months of marriage, he filed for divorce in June of 1973. And Diane had filed a response but did not contest the divorce, which was finalized two months later. Fred was also reportedly very physically a within the relationship. On May 25th, 1975, Diane, then age 39, married Robert De Leon, the 24-year-old managing editor of Jet Magazine. So a little bit of a full circle moment in a sense, considering she'd done some modeling for Jet Magazine decades before. There was a pretty significant age gap, and they actually met when Robert assigned himself to a cover story on Diane about her 1975 Oscar nomination for Claudine. Diane had moved to Chicago where Jet was headquartered, but soon Robert quit his job, so they relocated to Oakland. Unfortunately, Diane was widowed when Robert was killed in a car crash on March 31st, 1977. Her fourth and final marriage was to the singer Vic Damone in 1987, which was a very turbulent union. They were legally separated in 1991, then there was a reconciliation, and ultimately divorce in 1996. On the special called An Evening with Diane Carroll back in 2005, she says this about her four marriages. Getting married obviously was not the most important thing in my life. You don't do it four times if you've given the proper thought and the proper examination of what it means to be married. You don't do it four times. I was doing what I thought people do. They get married and they try to make it work as best they can. But I didn't get the information about what marriage is really all about until later in life. But I would also personally think that when it does come to being in the spotlight in Hollywood, that that probably wouldn't make things any easier. In 1984, Diana joined the cast of the nighttime soap opera Dynasty, which would probably be the show that most people would probably say that they know her from. She joined at the end of its fourth season as the mixed race jet set diva Dominique Devereaux, Blake Carrington's half-sister. Her high profile and very notable role on Dynasty also reunited her with her schoolmate Billy D. Williams, who briefly played her on-screen husband Brady Lloyd. She remained on the show and made several appearances on its short-lived spin-off The Colbys until she departed at the end of the seventh season in 1987. In 1989, she began the recurring role of Marion Gilbert in A Different World, for which she received her third Emmy nomination that same year. She went on to play a number of other roles from the early 1990s all the way up to 2014. There was The Five Heartbeats in 1991, Lonesome Dove the series in 1995, Sunset Boulevard the film version in 1996, The Legend of Tarzan 2001, Grace Anatomy in 2006, 
the show White Collar from 2008 to 2014, and even in the Tyler Perry film Peoples, where she played Nana Peoples. Of course, there are so many other roles that we can mention, but this would probably be a pretty lengthy video. In 2013, Diane was present on stage at the 65th Primetime Emmy Awards to briefly speak about being the first African American nominated for a Primetime Emmy Award. When talking about Kerry Washington, who was nominated for the show Scandal that year, she was quoted saying, she better get this award. Kerry does kind of give me a similar vibe to that of Diane, just very elegant and poised. Diane was a founding member of the Celebrity Action Council, which is a volunteer group of celebrity women who serve the women's outreach of the Los Angeles mission. Working with women in rehabilitation from problems with alcohol, drugs, or problems. She helped to form the group along with other female television personalities, including Mary Fran, Linda Gray, Donna Mills, and Joan Van Ark. Back in 1997, she was actually diagnosed with breast cancer, which came as a bit of a shock because she didn't have any family history of it, and she was also living a pretty healthy lifestyle. She underwent nine weeks of radiation therapy and had been cleared for years after the diagnosis, and also became an advocate for screening and early detection, as well as prevention of the disease. Although she had managed to remain clear for a number of years, unfortunately, Diane Carroll would pass away at her home in West. Hollywood, California on October 4th, 2019 at the age of 84 from cancer. She had also reportedly suffered from dementia around the time of her death, although the actor Mark Kopich, who played her character's son in Julia, said that she did not appear to show serious signs of cognitive decline as of late 2017. Her legacy is continued on by her only child and daughter, Suzanne Kay, and her two grandchildren, but also in her insane amount of work that she was able to complete throughout her lifetime, starting with her modeling, then TV shows, film, and even Broadway. A career spanning over six decades is a feat worth mentioning. She was, in my opinion, the epitome of sophistication and grace, and even when I would watch some of her interviews, her sense of humor was also something to note as she was very quick-witted and clever. She always tried to see the good in people and never spoke down on people regardless of their faults. One example of this would be Sidney Poitier. Although he has also passed on, when they were both still alive, apparently they didn't end their relationship on bad terms and were still friends, according to Diane, when she spoke about him in a 2005 interview where she said, It was long ago, speaking about their romantic relationship, I'm guessing. It was so long ago that I only maintain the memories that are good. He's a splendid human being. He's a wonderful actor. He's a good, thoughtful person when you have to talk something through that you're not really certain what direction to go. Sydney's the one to call, and I'm proud of that. Obviously, I'm sure there were people that she probably avoided talking about, but for the most part, she always tried to speak highly of everyone. I know this is probably going to sound a little cliche, but I kind of saw myself in her in some ways in terms of her personality. She wasn't loud or super boisterous, but she also wasn't quiet. She spoke up for herself when she felt she needed to and did so with so much class. I could definitely say I'm still working on the posture and sitting up straight, but I do really like how she carried herself regardless of what people had to say about her, and she was unapologetically herself. So that's going to be it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please do let me know your thoughts about it down in the comments. And also if you have any suggestions for future videos, let me know down there as well. And you're also welcome to check out any of these videos here on the screen. And also if you leave a like and a comment on those as well. And I'll catch you guys in the next one.